good morning. Welcome to Revolution. Let's stand together. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Let's worship together. See what happened there is I missed the cue. So we're going to try it again. Good morning. Jesus, they wash me white as snow. I believe in the power of the gospel. Still makes the broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away the stone. And I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise and come.
perfect Son of God in all his innocence. He walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrows, the son of suffering, blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. So imagine you, dearest in
a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. I'll praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Hallelujah. missionaries with Ethnos 360 in Papua New Guinea. All right, good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Just give it a minute. All right, guys, we're continuing our study uh, of Acts, Acts chapter 7. We've been in this chapter now for three weeks, and it's, um, it's really important for us uh, to really pay attention to Stephen's words. This is Stephen's sermon. Um, it's his uh, apologia, his, his, he, a speech in defense of. We're familiar with the term apologetics. This is Stephen's response to uh, four different charges of blasphemy that have been brought against him. Uh, so it's important that we pay attention to how he addresses those. Um, he makes an argument completely from Scripture, uh, just, just presenting one scriptural truth after another, addressing their charges of blasphemy. And ultimately it ends in Stephen... Um, accusing them of the, of the same thing they're accusing him of. So, um, we remember that this sermon ends in a stoning. Uh, it, it ends in Stephen's life being taken from him, um, and he would become the first martyr for the sake of Christ and for his gospel. And another thing I want to mention, I mentioned it last week, but Stephen has only been a Christian now for a matter of weeks, um, weeks, maybe just a couple of months, uh, as all of the believers have been. The, 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 the Christian church is very young. It's weeks old. Um, and Luke is careful to remind us or tell us in Scripture that Stephen is a man full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. So he's preaching Christ to his people. Uh, Stephen was a, a Hellenistic Jew. He was a uh, a Greek Jew by culture, 
Um, so he is preaching to other culturally Greek Jews, uh, and he's preaching concerning Christ uh, throughout all of the Old Testament, pointing, uh, using the Old Testament to point to Christ as the Messiah. And he finds himself in a debate um, with people that, that do not agree with him. And they begin to make these accusations against him. But according to Acts 6, uh, verse 10, they are unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he is speaking. They cannot argue with him. So when you can't win an argument, you start to slander the man, and that's what they do. Um, and they accuse him of this, these blasphemies. So they recruit men to lie against Stephen. And they accuse him of blasphemy against God, of blasphemy against Moses, uh, blaspheming the law, and blaspheming the temple. And as we've said the last couple of weeks, as far as the Jewish religion is concerned, there is nothing else left to blaspheme. Uh, they, are, they are alleging that Stephen is blaspheming all of Judaism. Um, so, it, this, is, this is an accusation of the highest regard as we've said, this accusation always uh, was punishable by death. The, the, the crime of blasphemy is punishable by death. And um, I mentioned this last week, and the more I considered it preparing for this week, it, it just continued to blow me away. As we talk about the, the happenings in Acts and, and if you've been with us, we've just come out of the book of John, um, the Gospel of John, looking at the life of Christ. The Lord Jesus performed all these miracles, and these men now, after the resurrection and, and ascension of Christ, have performed all these miracles in front of the same council. All of these men in the Sanhedrin and in, in the council, when we talk about um, um, Caiaphas, uh, the, the high priest, it's the same men. And the grace of God is such that He keeps putting men in front of them, giving them the gospel over and over, when weeks before they were shouting, crucify Him, crucify Him. And they made the claim, let His blood be on our sons, let, it, let His blood be on our heads, and the Lord continues to put the message of Christ in front of them over and over, offering forgiveness and repentance. Um, it is just an overwhelming display of the grace of God, and, and it is His divine providence that places these men in front of, in front of them over and over. Uh, so Stephen, his intent is not to to scorn them on further. He's not trying to make them mad. He's trying to lead them to repentance. He's trying to preach the gospel to them. And he stands in front of them with the eyes of everyone on him. And Scripture tells us he has the face of an angel. So he prepares to give his speech in defense of his sermon. I'm going to uh, pray for us here in a minute, but when we get to Acts 7 verse 1, he's asked, how do you plead? He's asked by Caiaphas, the high priest, are these things so? How do you plead? So court is in session, and again, disciples are standing in front of this same group for the third time, getting ready to preach the gospel, and he, and he must know the answer he's going to get. Caiaphas and the whole Sanhedrin must know the response that they're going to get, and, and he's counting on it, I think to carry out the evil motives of his heart. He, he wants an excuse to make a martyr out of Stephen. So Stephen begins to address the accusations one at a time. And again, they first accuse him of blasphemy against God. So he begins by calling God the God of glory. If you were here last week, that's found in Psalm 29. Psalm 29, verse 3, David declares the God of glory thunders. The reason Stephen uses the God of glory as the name of God um, is because the God of glory is the summation of all the attributes of God. Everything that God says of Himself, all the names that He's given Himself are summed up in the God of glory. And we see that only one other time in Scripture, and that's in Psalm 29. And they all would have known exactly what that reference 
was and what it meant. So that's why he uses that. And that's to say that I believe in the same God you believe in. We're talking about the same God. I'm not blaspheming the God of the Bible. The point of that, too, is Stephen doesn't want to give them an opportunity to say, well, you left out this attribute or that attribute. He sums it all up in the God of glory to make sure that they're talking about the same God. And then he goes on to give a perfect history lesson right out of their shared text, uh, being careful to correctly explain the covenant with Abraham and the beginning of their people. He says, I came from Abraham, Abraham as you did. I came from Isaac as you did. I came from Jacob as you did. And I'm part of the people of promise as you are. And he begins to set up his indictment in Acts 7, verse 9. He says, the, the patriarchs, the twelve sons of Jacob, the twelve fathers uh, of the twelve tribes of Israel, became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him. He goes on to say that Joseph, you remember the story, he becomes the governor of Egypt. Joseph has a dream, tells his brothers they're going to bow before him. He's going to save them. They hate that. They grow jealous of him. They want to kill him. One brother speaks up, so they throw him in a pit. They see slave traders coming. He's sold into slavery into Egypt. He finds himself as the governor of Egypt. And sure enough, years later, he saves his whole family. He is held in such high regard uh, by Pharaoh. Pharaoh um, tells his whole family to move to Egypt. They move there, and they begin to multiply. And that's where we're going to start this morning. I normally pray right off the bat, but I sort of got knocked off my routine. Not feeling great. So I'm going to pray for us and then we'll get started. If you guys would bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this word. God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you're sovereign, that you're in control. God, that this word is inspired that it has been protected, that it is complete. God, I'm thankful that you've given us the Old Testament, that we can see the fulfillment of it in Christ, and that our faith is assured because of that. I pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. God, that you would give us a desire to be able to defend our faith, a desire to be able to defend our faith biblically. God, that we would love Your Word, that we would know Your Word. God, ultimately, that You'd be glorified. Well, we ask You these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to start this morning in, in Acts 7, verse 17. So, he's addressed blasphemy against God, right? He calls Him the God of glory, and he explains that. Um, and he also just wants to show that he's pro-Israel, that he's not against them, but he is one of them. So that's what he does up through verse 17. And now he's going to charge, uh, address the charge of blasphemy against Moses. If you guys want to follow along with me, Acts 7, 17 through 37. Uh, yeah, we're going to try to get through 53. Um, <laughs> that's funny you guys laugh. I wasn't joking. All right, 17. But as the time of promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. And it was this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was... Uh, nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power and words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defeated, or defended him 
and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together. And he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look, but the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Keep that in mind and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you ruler and judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and deliverer with the help of of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for forty years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. So a new Pharaoh comes along uh, and doesn't know anything about Joseph uh, or his relationship with the previous Pharaoh. And he sees the Israelites multiplying like crazy. And he becomes afraid that they're going to overthrow the Egyptians. Excuse me. So he persecutes the Israelites by killing their sons, except for one. The Lord providentially protects Moses, Acts 7 through 22. It was at that time Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God. That that means that he was extremely handsome. He was a a good-looking baby, and and, and all through his life, he was just regarded as a good-looking man. He was nurtured three three months in his father's home. So after that time, they couldn't keep him hidden anymore, and he was set outside. You remember a basket was made, and he was set in the river, and Pharaoh's daughter just happened to pick him up out of the river and and take him in as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. Moses was uh, a well-known, powerful man. He became the prince of Egypt. He was lovely in the sight of God, and he was elevated to royalty. Highly educated, a man of power, a man that could do something about the situation the Israelites were in. We remember the beginning of the Count of Moses. It's familiar to us, but it's very similar to our Lord's, right? He was born, uh, a census was, they they were to take a census, so all of Israel was traveling. Mary uh, is getting ready to go into labor. There's nowhere for her uh, to go, so she finds herself in a stable, and Christ is born. The wise men come to worship Him, but Herod gets a hold of them and says, who have you come to worship, and where is He at? And he he orders that all the Israelite babies are killed. Sounds similar to Moses. And that's the point. That's what Stephen is wanting to get across to them. And he goes on, Acts 7, 23 and 24, but when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. So you've got to think that he was raised actually by his mother for several months. Um, it had been arranged for, him, for her to nurse him. So she certainly told him about his people as he was getting older. She was around him. So he goes to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel, and when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him, took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. He buries the body in the sand. So when Moses did this, he thought that this would show his people that he was was for them. Remember, he was a man in high regard. 
uh, in Egypt, in, in the house of Pharaoh, educated in their ways. He was powerful. He was capable of changing the circumstance of his people. He was capable of being a deliverer. And he thought that his people would see him that way, Acts 7.25. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. So at this point, you have to think that the council that, that Stephen is sitting in front of is starting to put these things together. Um, but understand, Stephen is not making an argument of his own, trying to direct them down a path. He is simply presenting Scripture as it is written. And he is showing them, this is what your forefathers did to Moses, and this is what they've done to Christ. He, he's starting to mount that uh, case and, 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 that, and show them that picture so again, this isn't Stephen's opinion. It's, it's the Word of God in context. And in this instance, it is very sharp. We'll see that in their response. In verse 26, Stephen reminds them that Moses came back to visit his, visit his people and saw them fighting with each other and tried to reconcile them together, reminding them that they are their brothers and they shouldn't fight each other. And then verse 27 and 28 shows us their response. But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler? and judge over us. You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? So just to give us a picture of, of what has happened, Moses is royalty in Egypt. He's well known. He carries great weight and authority in all of Egypt. And a slave pushes him away. Moses was desiring to help his people. His people rejected him. So he leaves. He goes to Midian to hide out there, meets his wife, has two sons. There's a period of 40 years, so he's 80-ish. And we remember the story. An angel appears to him in the wilderness on Mount Sinai. There's a flame in the burning bush. Or there's a flame. that A, a bush is on fire, but it's not burning. It's not being consumed. Verse 31 says he marveled at the sight as he approached it. It began to speak to him. So remember that God spoke to him in the bush. He's on holy ground, so he takes off his shoes. Look, look what our Lord says to Moses in verse 34. I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and, and have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. I have come down to rescue them. They knew that Scripture said that, that God was, the Messiah was going to come from heaven. He was going to come down. Remember what the Lord says to Nicodemus in John 3.13? It says, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Moses was persecuted as a baby, completely helpless of himself, and God providentially protected him to raise him up to deliver Israel. Our Lord was persecuted as a baby, completely help, helpless of Himself, and God providentially protected Him to, deli to deliver all that would call on His name. You see the, see the similarities in Moses? He's a, a type and shadow of Christ. It's the same with Joseph. Moses delivers them, and in, a week's, uh, and in weeks they, they, they turn on him. They act like they've... So, so these men in the council act like they've always held Moses in the highest regard. But when Moses leads these people out of Israel or Egypt, it doesn't take very long for them to, to not want anything to do with Moses. The Lord goes to the cross for Israel, but they delight in hanging him there. But he's coming back. Right? So Stephen quotes Moses in verse 37, trying to show them their hypocrisy and, and condemning them further. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. He's talking about Christ. Moses was a shepherd. That's what he's doing on Mount Sinai. Remember that? Jesus is the shepherd. Moses did signs and wonders. Jesus did many signs and wonders. Moses gives the law. What did Christ say? I've come to fulfill the law. Stephen is showing them that Joseph and Moses were both anointed by God. They were God's chosen for that time to take care of His people. And that every time they were rejected, 
by Israel. And he's saying, this council so highly regards these men and all of your forefathers rejected them. So Stephen now addresses the charge of blasphemy of the law. Let's look at Acts 7, uh, 38 through 42. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, talking about Moses, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. That is the law, the Ten Commandments. 39, our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him in their hearts and turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt We do not know what happened to him. At the time they had made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? So Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, remember that? Um, The Lord's thundering from heaven. You've come to a place that cannot be touched. No man or beast could touch the mountain. Moses goes up, receives the Ten Commandments. On his way down, he sees this nation of Israel that the Lord has saved from Egypt, worshiping idols that they've made with their own hands. And remember, he throws the the tablets 1.0 on the ground and breaks him because he's so furious. He's so mad at these people. Before he can make it all the way down the mountain, they go and ask Aaron to make gods for them so they can worship worship them. And, And before you get too upset with Aaron, I think it was an attempt in a roundabout way to keep them from doing that by saying, if you want me to do this for you, you got to go bring me all of your gold, all of your jewelry, hoping that that would deter them, and it doesn't. They think Moses is gone for too long. It is just astonishing to me, at least reading it in Scripture, the picture of, of where they are, camp below this mountain, and the voice of God is thundering. They know where Moses is at. It's not like they don't know what's going on. And that is not enough for them. In the presence of a holy God. And, and he, his voice is thundering in such a way, it says there's a tempest on the mountain. So picture a tornado, thunder, lightning. And every time he speaks, the ground is shaking. And the Israelites are saying, they're asking the Lord to stop speaking. Moses comes down with the tablets. And in that amount of time, they've forsaken the God that brought them out of Egypt disregarded Moses entirely, and have made for themselves Egyptian idols to worship. He says, the the point is, Stephen is saying, you say that I've blasphemed the law, but it's you that actually hate the law. You've blasphemed the law. You've rejected it from the beginning, and you've worshipped worshipped other gods from the beginning. What does the Lord say to the Pharisees? You whitewashed tombs. Right? You're dead on the inside. You have appearance of the law on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. They've made their own religion. Their own, it, it's not, they're not serving God, the God that they claim to be serving. Acts 7.42, but God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? Then he addresses the charge of blasphemy against the temple. And that starts in Acts 7, 43. So you, just, you can see he's just systematically going through these things. I, I didn't blaspheme God. You did. I didn't blaspheme Moses. You do. I don't blaspheme the law. You still blaspheme the law. And now he's going to look at the temple. 7, 43 through 50. You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god of Rampha, the images which are made to worship, which you made to worship, I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern which he had seen. 
And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon disposing the nations, or dispossessing the nations, taking over the land they were told to take over, whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Talking about the prophet Isaiah. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? So verse 43, you took along a pagan temple to worship pagan gods. Verse 44, our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony that the Lord gave directly to Moses. He told Moses to build it, how to build it. And that tabernacle and, and, and that pattern was passed down to Joshua until the time of David. So the temple, the, the tabernacle that, that God gave to His people was cared for and passed down and, and was exactly what God had ordained until the time of David. And then David, a man after the Lord's own heart, Scripture tells us, thought, the Lord cannot dwell in a house less extravagant than my own. He wanted to build the Lord a more extravagant temple. He went to Nathan. Nathan said, sounds like a great idea. Then the Lord comes to him and says, why would you tell him to do that? I'm, I'm grossly paraphrasing, by the way. Uh, he didn't say it this way, but he tells David not to build it. He actually says that your son is going to build it. Your son Solomon is going to build the, the house for the Lord. So Solomon builds a temple. But listen to what even Solomon says about the temple, about the idea of God dwelling in a temple. We find it in 1 Kings 8, 27 through 30. This is Solomon speaking, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant prays before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of, of which you have said, My name shall be there to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. Listen to the supplication of your servant and to your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear in heaven your dwelling place. Hear and forgive. Where does King Solomon say the Lord dwells? In heaven. Solomon builds God a temple but knows that God cannot and does not dwell in a house built by human hands. He says, hear in heaven your dwelling place. And he goes on to quote Isaiah uh, in verse 48. Stephen does. He says, Heaven is my throne. This is the Lord speaking. And the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me? Says the Lord. What place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? I have built and made everything. You can build no place for me. And remember the, Lord, the words of our Lord concerning the temple that, that Stephen is standing in in this text. And these men were there too when the Lord did this. John 2, 18-22. Remember, they've made it a den of thieves. And he runs them out. He, he, he's whipping them and, and overturning tables. John 2, 18-22. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us for your authority to do these things? How, by what authority are you turning over these tables in the temple and running us out of here. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews had said it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. They, they didn't get it and they still don't. But he was speaking to the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. It says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The worship team wants to come back up. Remember how John started his gospel? John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is tabernacle. Tabernacle. He, he, the, the temple of God dwells among His people. Stephen is saying that 
Not even David and Solomon thought more of the temple than they should. They knew God couldn't dwell in a building, and He could not be contained, but He is seen in Christ, and we are in Him. He is the Messiah. The the temple was pointing to Him. David uses this kind of language all over the Psalms, but Psalm 91.9, For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. Our Lord prays to the Father in John 17, 21. Remember this? He says, of those that will come to Him, of those that are His since the foundation of the, of the earth, this is, this is our Lord praying for, for us, for all those that will be His to the Father, that they may all be one, even as You, Father, are in Me and I in You, that they may also be in us so that the, so that the world may believe that You sent me, that they may also be in us. Christ is the fulfillment of the tabernacle. We are in Christ. So just as a quick word before closing this morning, there are many, it's increasingly popular and more mainstream, there are many that would have you disregard the Old Testament, say it's not necessary. There's a word, unhitch, that's been thrown around that we should unhitch from the Old Testament, that it's, it's really not necessary for the modern believer. Stephen is not a Christian because of the New Testament. There are no men in this room, or not in this room, but, but amidst this council that have come to know Christ, none of the apostles None of the other disciples, every convert in that time was a Christian because of the Old Testament. And these men are condemned because they don't believe that Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We are believers because of the Old Testament. We've come to have faith in Christ because God has said before the beginning of time, My Christ will look like this. And Jesus comes, and He looks just like everything He said He was going to look like. He did everything He said He was going to accomplish. We read the accounts of men like Joseph and Moses, and we see Christ in those accounts. So we need the Old Testament. (laughs) We're thankful to have the Old Testament. If anyone comes to you saying, disregard the Old Testament, disregard them immediately. All of the book is inspired. And we don't want to depart from any of it. Amen? If you guys would stand, let's worship together for a few more minutes.
first time we'd love to have the chance to meet you. We hope to see you guys next Sunday at 9.30. Have a great week.